In this lesson, we will learn about the use of non-parametric statistical tests that do not rely on specific assumptions about the underlying data distribution. As we'll discover, this makes them suitable for a wide range of data types, including nominal level data that we learned to display in Module 2. Let's review what we've learned so far in this course about hypothesis testing. In the last module, we learned to calculate and determine the significance of test statistics. We compare it to the appropriate chart and based on the degrees of freedom, and the level of significance, if the absolute value of the test statistic is greater than the critical value, we reject the null hypothesis, and it's a significant result. Or, we look at the p-value and we compare that to 0.05. If the p-value is less than 0.05, or 5%, then the null hypothesis is rejected, and the result is significant. We will do the same thing to the test results in this module. Parametric tests and nonparametric tests are two approaches used in statistical inference to make inferences about population data. Parametric tests assume that the data follows a specific probability distribution with interval ratio data that follows a normal distribution. Nonparametric tests, on the other hand, do not assume a specific data distribution or make explicit assumptions about the data and work with categorical data. Therefore, nonparametric tests are robust to violations of distributional assumptions and are appropriate when the data distribution is unknown or when the data deviates from normality. These tests rely on fewer assumptions, making them more flexible and applicable to a wider range of data types. The selection of a nonparametric test depends on several factors, including the research question, and the type of data to be analyzed, including the number of groups under study and the comparisons being made. Examples of nonparametric tests that involve independent groups are listed here by the level of measurement and the number of groups they analyze. The chi-square test is a statistical test used to determine if there is a significant association between two categorical variables. It assesses whether the observed frequencies of the categories differ significantly from the expected frequencies under the assumption of independence. Recall from the last module our premise of a null hypothesis, and its evaluation with a test statistic. The null hypothesis for a chi-square test states that there is no association or relationship between the variables. In other words, it assumes that the variables are independent of each other. To evaluate the null hypothesis, we calculate the chi-square test statistic based on the observed frequencies and compare it to the chi-square distribution with the appropriate degrees of freedom. As with the other tests we have learned in this course, if the calculated test statistic yields a value that is greater than the critical value, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is evidence of an association between the variables. Specifically, for a chi-square test of independence, the null hypothesis states that the observed frequencies in each cell of the contingency table, the proportion across groups, are consistent with what would be expected under the assumption of independence. It suggests that any deviations between the observed and expected frequencies are due to random chance. The alternative hypothesis states that the proportion across the groups are not equal. Something is causing a change in the counts of the categories under study. The chi-square test makes certain assumptions to ensure the validity of the test results. These include assumptions we have seen in other tests such as random sampling and independent observations. In addition, the expected frequencies in each cell of the contingency table should be greater than zero. The general logic behind a chi-square test involves comparing the observed frequencies in a contingency table to the expected frequencies under the assumption of independence between two categorical variables. The test determines whether the observed deviations from expected frequencies are statistically significant or if they can be attributed to random chance. So, here's an example with incontinence data. As we learned in Module 2, contingency or cross-tabulation tables have a certain setup to display and analyze nominal level data. Our dependent variable, that would be our outcome here, whether or not the patient was incontinent. A nominal level variable. The group they are in goes in the columns, that's the independent variable, the treatment or experimental group and the control group. This table tells us we have 30 people total that are incontinent for outcome. In each of our groups we have 50 patients each. In the control group 20 were incontinent and for the experimental group 10 were incontinent. So, it seems that we've lowered incontinence in the experimental group, and that's a good thing right? But how do we know that is a significant result and not just due to chance? To find out, 
we have to look at what's called an expected frequency. Here, for the first cell, the expected frequency is that observed frequency for the entire row the cell is in times the observed frequency for the entire column divided by n. So that's 30 times the column total, which is 50 divided by 100, which equals 15. If the null hypothesis is true, we should have 15 incontinent patients in each group, right? That's what the expected count is. We do that calculation for the entire table. We then calculate the chi-square test statistic by the formula in the lecture notes. For each cell, we square the difference between the observed and expected frequency divided by the expected frequency. So for the first cell, it's 10 minus 15 squared, which is 25, divided by 15, which is 1.67, right? Then we add up all the cells in the table to get the chi-square test statistic. Then we look at the chi-square distribution chart like we did for the t-test, by the degrees of freedom, which is the rows minus 1 times the columns minus 1, so, here, 2 minus 1 is 1, and 1 times 1 is 1 degree of freedom. And then we look at the critical value in the chi-square distribution table at our 5% level to see if our result is significant. And here we see it is for this data set. The treatment affects incontinence here. There is a relationship, and we can reject the null hypothesis. There are some corrections we do to the chi-square test. It is important to note that if we have expected values of less than 5 in our table, in a 2 by 2 table, we use a what's called a Fisher's exact test that basically corrects for the low expected counts. And if it falls below 10, typically we use what's called a Yates correction. The other index we can use for 2 by 2 tables looks at the strength of the relationship in our table, also known as the effect size. For a 2 by 2 table, that's called a fee index and that index is closely related to what we did with Pearson's R values in Module 2. For larger tables, those with more groups, we use what's called a Kramer's V index for the magnitude of effect. These indexes are both calculated by computer software. The results of the power analysis can be represented in a chi-square power table. This table displays different combinations of effect sizes, significance levels, and power values, along with the corresponding required sample sizes. Example here, with a Kramer's V of 20%, we would need 241 subjects in a 2 by 3 table to reach 80% power. By conducting a power analysis and ensuring an adequate sample size, researchers can increase the likelihood of detecting significant associations between variables in a chi-square test and avoid underpowered studies that may fail to detect true effects. Let's do some examples of chi-square. We can go back to our ANOVA example where we had the groups of mice and MGP supplements. Now the groups were analyzed for two years of survival. This is a category, right? The mice either survived or they did not, yes or no here. And we have the group they were in, so can we create a table for this one, and we have all the data, so we can create data for each subject. So, we go to StackCrunch and we start our table. We have 24 subjects, right? We will end up with 24 lines of data in StackCrunch with two categories we can type, survived, and the group. Then we just start entering the data. Four of the low-fat and high-fat fed group and two of the high-fat plus MGP died before two years, so those are our no's. The rest are yeses for survival. Once the data is in, we can create our contingency table and perform a chi-square test. To do that, click on the stat tab menu, and then click on tables, and then contingency and with data as we have all the data so here. We do this in module 2. The contingency table dialog box appears and by default the chi-square test is selected, so we now leave that on. Next, we select our dependent and independent variables. Our outcome here is survived, the dependent variable, and it goes in the rows. The group is the independent variable and it goes in the columns. Next, we're going to create the cross-tabulation table by selecting row percent, column percent, and the percent of total. In addition, we can now select the expected count. We click Compute to make the table and perform the test. Look first at the expected counts. Again, if the null hypothesis is true, this is what we would expect to see, 2.92 or about 3 mice not surviving, and we have 4 here that did not survive. It looks like some of these mice are dying ahead of what they should be. Whether that's significant or not, we have to look at the chi-square result. 
First, we see a p-value of 31%, way above our 5% cutoff. That tells us this result is, not significant. We can then look at the value of the chi-square statistic of 2.31, and when we compare that to the critical values in the table, we see that it is not greater than the table value of 5.99 at 2 degrees of freedom. This further confirms that this result is not significant. We do have a warning here because we've got some expected counts less than 5. Now we can't use a Fisher's test correction here, because that's only for 2 by 2 tables, and we've got a 3 by 2 table. But we may want to follow up with result with a more advanced strategy, but either way this is not a significant result. And we can copy and paste this data into Word to properly label our table. Let's do an example with summary data with this Pew Research study that looked at how to deal with online harassment in patients with depression. 917 patients were randomly assigned to two groups and asked that they thought that the strategy they employed was effective. Recall that we can set up a contingency table in StackCrunch with summary data by putting the dependent variable in the first column, and then typing in the counts of two groups in the next column based on the outcomes of that first dependent variable, the effectiveness of the strategy in this case. So here we have 549 subjects that ignored the harassment. 455 thought it was effective, so that number goes here, and the rest, 94, said it was not effective. 368 responded online to the harassment and 276 thought it was effective, which leaves 92 that said it was not effective. We can run the test with the summary data, selecting the dependent variable for the rows, effective in this case, then select our two independent variable columns, and the selections to create our table. Here we have a significant result with a p-value below 5%. The last example for this lesson comes from the Excel data sheet of the case study for this module that examined Babesia infection and blood type. Can we calculate the chi-square value reported in the paper of 5.10? If we look at the Excel data sheet, this is all nominal level data, right? Just counts of infections by blood type. We have all summary data here that we can set up in StackCrunch. This study had nearly a million patients, 861,712 to be exact, as reported in the case study paper. Table 1 of the research paper, we see a total of 693,662 RHD positive patients that were non-reactive to a test for the infection. That's a no for the Babesia infection count for the RHD positive group in our StackCrunch setup. 594 RHD positive group patients were reactive to the infection test. That's a yes for the Babesia infection count for the RHD positive group in our StackCrunch setup. The paper reported a total infection count of 768 infections across all these blood types, so that means 174 patients are a yes for the Babesia infection count for the RHD negative group. That leaves us with one more cell to calculate. That's the no for the Babesia infection count for the RHD negative group. Since we have 861,712 patients in the study, and we know that a total of 768 tested positive for the infection, that leaves 860,944 patients non-reactive or a no for the total Babesia infection count. Since we know that 693,662 RHD positive patients were not infected, we can get the counts of the patients that were not infected and not RHD positive just by subtracting those 693,662 patients from the total 860,944 patients that had no Babesia infection, and we get 167,282 that goes in our summary table. We know we did the math right if our cross-tabulation table gives us the total number of patients here, 861,712. We can create the cross-tabulation table and perform the chi-square test in StackCrunch, being sure to select the outcome here, the Babesia infection, as the dependent variable that goes in the rows. And we see that we are right, we can recreate the research results using StackCrunch. Overall, the non-parametric chi-square test provides a valuable tool for analyzing nominal level data, allowing researchers to determine whether there is a statistically significant association between categorical variables. 
In the next lesson, we will learn about other nonparametric tests to analyze nominal and ordinal level data.